Hello again, I am Jonathan Leonard and this is the first of three videos dedicated to exploring the mysteries of human memory. For starters, we need to recognize that human memory is quirky. It's not like a computer's memory where if you put certain things in you can get the same things out. So why is human memory quirky? Why do we remember some things and not others? Why do we awaken sometimes in the middle of the night having suddenly recalled something that we had utterly forgotten when we went to sleep? And given these quirks, how do some people manage to memorize things as long and detailed as the Bible? How do others memorize procedures like riding a unicycle? And how do still others develop a deep store of knowledge that then allows them to do things creatively like teach, argue before a judge, or practice medicine. These are all things that brain science has now started to unravel. For starters, one might think that memory inside your brain is simply what you can remember consciously, what you had for breakfast this morning, the smell of a strong cigar, your mother's face, and so on. This is what psychologists call declarative memory, but there is far more to memory than that. For instance, think about serving a tennis ball. Clearly, this is mostly a learned procedure that has been memorized, but this memory is not called up into consciousness. Rather, the reverse is true. Consciousness summons it and any of a million other learned procedures, how to run, use a pencil, kick a ball, when we want to perform any of these tasks. So besides our declarative memories, these consciously summoned procedures are also part of memory, a part called procedural memory. Even with both these kinds of consciously summoned memory, we have only scratched the surface. For example, when you hear me speak, it's not hard to understand my message. But you didn't consciously summon the procedures needed to translate my sounds into words, define the words, put the words together, and extract meaning from the message. Rather, the incoming sensory information, my speech, activated those procedures unconsciously. In a like fashion, procedures for receiving, processing, deciphering, combining, and associating, everything that we see, hear, touch, taste, smell, feel, and think are present in the brain. To the extent that such procedures have been learned at one time or another, they are rightly considered part of memory, not of conscious memory, but of the brain's memory. So declarative memories, like the appearance of your living space or the name of your favorite pet, can be recalled into your conscious mind. But many other memories cannot, either because they are procedural memories used only to summon up procedures, or because they are parts of the brain's memory that are activated more or less automatically by the right nerve impulses, but that are not strongly connected to the conscious memory recall system. Well then, how do all these memories get formed? As was noted earlier on our introductory videos, brain impulses travel slowly, typically around 50 miles an hour. So your brain needs to be well coordinated and compact in order to minimize processing time as much as possible. It doesn't have the luxury of putting memories in special little memory purses scattered all about. That wastes time and space. Instead, so far as we can tell, the brain uses incoming messages to set up patterns of brain cell interactions. It needs to do this as part of its normal business, because these patterns may be needed to process similar information in the future. And it sets things up so that these patterns can be activated later. The question then becomes, how does such message processing leave records in the brain? The general answer is well known. The general answer is, neurons that fire together, wire together. On the downside, Synapses and even entire neurons that are not used tend to weaken and die out. But if a neuron fires down its axon and across a synapse to another neuron, the synapse will tend to change in such a way that the next time it will be easier to cross, and so this tie between the two neurons will be strengthened. 
More dramatically, we now know that extensive communications between neurons can lead to creation of new synapses, further strengthening the bonds between those neurons. Also, synapses can shift about quickly in response to a host of stimulations, and neurons firing together can create or modify coordinated neural networks through a process known as long-term potentiation. The result of all this is that neurons generally wire together in complex patterns that reflect their actual use. So if you see a robin, for example, the incoming signals will activate a host of neurons that respond to bird-like objects or that get involved in bird identification until the assessment gets refined down to a point where you can say, that's a robin. This process reinforces and enriches the robin record in your brain each time it happens, because the neural connections involved get strengthened. And since you've doubtless seen thousands of robins of different sorts from different angles and distances under different lighting conditions, this robin record is well established and rather broad. We can also see how portions of this well-established Robin record tie into conscious memory. For no actual Robins are needed. Just as you can call up an image of your mother, you can call up the image of a Robin. So you can consciously activate portions of this Robin record any time you like. And that's how this consciously recallable declarative memory operates. At this point in our highly simplified theoretical journey, we strike a rock, the rock of associations. As pointed out in earlier videos, the brain is highly regional. Vision is processed in one area, hearing in another, and so forth. Perhaps our robin record is mostly visual, though robins do make sounds. But how about our record for apple, which involves appearance, taste, touch, eating sounds, aromatic smells, etc.? And how about our record for mother with the vast multitude of thoughts, feelings, and events and additional sensory information this conjures up? If recognition and memory records are enshrined in neural processing patterns scattered all about the brain, how do these widely dispersed records get together in our memories? And how does our conscious mind come to associate such diverse recollections? This matter of memory coordination is the subject of my next video.